Hey everybody, this is Nima from Calming Technology at Stanford University. So this is a guest speaker, Philippe Goldin from the Stanford Affective Neuroscience Lab, and he's going to be discussing his view on the neuroscience of calming. In actually many different traditions, came back to the United States um, with a stopover in Sweden first, uh, and then just uh, the main thing I want to say, the first thing I want to say is it, when you can figure out what makes you happy, and whatever combination of things that is, that, that you wake up in the morning and you're motivated to go to school, work, whatever, that's when you know that you've really, I would say that's emotional intelligence. That's intelligence. Um, and so many people suffer unnecessarily out of insecurity, doubt, et cetera. Um, but anyway, let's do a little bit of stuff. And there's no pressure to get through everything. And I will be asking at different points for your participation. So. Um, <clears throat> motivation. So the motivation basically, and how many people here are graduate students? And how many of you worked before you came back to graduate school? OK, just a couple. So you really, even in the best, best place, because I also work and teach at Google as well and, and do some research there, you know, and that's a fantastic place, but people are freaking stressed out. Drugs, alcohol, back pain, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, even in the best place to work. And it's actually worse at Facebook, because I know people who work there. So even in the best place in the United States, and we are trying to remedy that, and I, we can talk about that later, because we've actually set up programs for employees to address anxiety, depression, insecurity, self-doubt, um, drug use, alcohol, back pain. Even in the creme de la creme, right? They're fucked up. Because <laughs> so, <laughs> it's really stressful. Really stressful. And you know, as all of you know, you were probably number one or two wherever you went to high school, and then you came here, and now you are, who knows, you're not number one or two probably. <laughs> and that's stressful in people who have high perfectionism. So anyway, motivation here is to recognize just the first fundamental truth that there's plenty, and you all know, kinds of anxiety, stress, angst, insecurity, self-doubt. I'm not pretty enough. I'm too fat. I don't have a nice body. My lips aren't right. I'm not bright enough, blah, blah, blah. All of us have our favorite top 10, right? We all have it. So the question is, how do you get from this kind of angst, pain, suffering, especially in the workplace, because that's where people spend most of their time, even when they have kids. And I have two daughters now as well. And how do you get to this more enlightened, at ease, peaceful, creative, innovative state of mind. Because actually, that's what we need in the workplace. It's no longer about how intelligent you are. And I know because I've been coaching Google engineers for the past four years. It's not about IQ anymore. It used to be. But that's not what makes you succeed anymore in the workplace. So the goal here, in terms of the work that I do, which is translational, clinical neuroscience, I actually work with patients with anxiety disorders, and also healthy adults, and prisoners, and engineers at Google, all different kinds of people. How do you use one type of technology, one type of meditation practice, there are many kinds, mindfulness, and we'll define it in a moment, to see how does it actually impact in a human animal, us, brain systems related to emotional awareness, emotional uh, de detection, emotion generation, and then top-down emotion regulation techniques. And how does this actually, in the real world, impact psychological stress? And with the, the clear intention or motivation to recognize the phenomena, the problems, the causes, the triggers, and to reduce suffering and optimize performance. Because you can just think, when you have people who are working for you who are stressed out, they are not performing 100%. If they're not performing 100%, why are you paying them 100% salary? They're not performing optimally. So attention. Attention refers to many different things. It is the gateway into all higher order cognitive functions. If your attention is distracted, forget about your PhD, your frontal cortex, all your education, you're not accessing it. So we start with a bottom-up approach of training different aspects of attention. It has multiple components. And I think it's also, it, on an individual level, the more that we can learn how our own attentional systems work and don't work, 
when they're functioning and dysfunctional, that'll be super important for your own well-being and your performance. It's limited. We can only attend to a certain amount of material in different domains. And it's all happening in the brain. And that's why I like, love studying the brain, because people can report things, but often, in some cases, the brain, brain signal <coughs> speaks much more clearly than people's mouths. In other contexts, what people are aware of is valid. But in most contexts, self-report is not that good. <laughs> it really isn't. But it's also important, right? Because what people think about themselves is often more important than the truth. This is important to just keep to plant into your mind. In the center, in green, is that green bar represents an attentionally balanced state. This is when you are in the flow, attentionally focused. And this is where you perform optimally. This is not where we are most of the time. If you can recognize what it feels like in your own skin to be in this state, as opposed to mind wandering, zoning out, mental fatigue, tiredness, right? Most people here, I bet you 95% of us have some kind of sleep problems or we have chronic sleep fatigue. But if you can figure out what it feels like to be here and to recognize it when you are in an optimal attentional state, super important. So about to, up until about a few years ago, no one would ever, no respectable scientist, would talk about any kind of Eastern philosophy, Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, meditation, as a scientist, no one would. Now, it's all the rage. And this is just to represent in one of our best journals. The front cover is about research on Buddhist practices to train the mental quality, qualities of attention. <laughs> focused attention and open monitoring. I'm going to define them. So here, focused attention, nothing magical at all. It's just the ability to focus your attention with gentle but firm intensity on an object of your choice in a sustained manner. Chess, mathematicians, athletes have this. So that's why I put a picture of Michael Jordan. Utterly, completely, 100% focused attention, goal-oriented. That's one type of practice. Another kind of practice, training attention, for lack of a better term, open monitoring, metacognitive attention. And this is monitoring the moment-to-moment -moment ebb and flow of experience, your own experience, from moment to moment, in order to recognize patterns of thoughts, images, memories, interpretations in your own mind stream, which is the most important place to be attentive, what you're actually doing in your own mind. So this is a very different type of quality. So now I'm going to invite you to put everything down, and I'm actually going to guide you through these briefly, through these two practices. So it's not just intellectual, but you'll experience what it's like. So just take a position where you feel at ease, comfortable in the chair. See if you can, in this moment, actually relax your neck, relax your shoulders, relax the 42 muscles in our face that we're constantly working while we're awake. See if you can just gently, with your eyes open or your gaze down, you can have your eyes closed or you can have your eyes open and bring your gaze down so you're not looking at other people. And gently bring your attention towards the tip of your nose, inside the nostrils, and simply become aware of the sensations of your own breath. With each inhalation and then exhalation, what do you actually observe and notice? The movement of the breath with each inhalation and exhalation. No right or wrong. See how clear and focused you can place your attention on your own breath. If your mind starts to get a little unclear or tired, see if you can energize it lightly. And bring your attention back to the breath. You don't have to change any way that you're breathing. 
simply observing the movement and sensation. Your attention is anchored on the breath. Now I'd like you to, keeping your eyes closed or where they are, shift your attention to this open monitoring. Now I'd like you to simply notice everything and anything that crosses your mind. Any image, any thought, any memory, <clears throat> but allowing each moment of awareness to give way to the next moment. Not holding on or pushing away anything. Simply observing what comes and moves through your mind stream. Arising, changing, dissolving, giving way to the next thing that moves through your mind. And now take three deep breaths at your own pace and then open your eyes. Okay. By show of hands, how many people felt more distracted in the first part where you were focusing your attention on the object of breath? Distracted. How many people felt more distracted in the second part when we were doing the open monitoring, just noticing <clears throat> individual differences? Utterly interesting. Some people find one form of practice. And these are just two different types of training. There are many, many, many kinds. There's huge technology from over 3,000 years ago of all different kinds of techniques. But now let's move to some research. Antoine Lutz, University of Wisconsin-Madison, has done some great uh, research on this focused attention on a specific object in uh, Americans who did three months of training, silent meditation retreat. He looked at a dichotic listening task to see whether how much neural response was pulled towards a uh, distracting object, or sound rather, sound. And what he found was, to make it simple, <clears throat> essentially he looked at, in the red lines are people who did pre, post, uh, three months of meditation. The blue are novices who, did, who only got like 10 minutes. The key thing that was shown here in bright red using EEG, which is a measurement of electrical signals that are summed up, that are perpendicular to the surface of the scalp, electroencephalograph. And basically found that people were able to sustain their attention even in the presence of distracting sounds like a woman screaming, a baby crying. And that's what that solid red line uh, shows. And it shows that actually there was less cognitive effort after three months of training in being able to sustain your attention. One simple task one type of meditation practice, one clear result. One aspect of attention, like a muscle, that actually is enhanced with this practice. Mindfulness-based stress reduction is one type of program that's been developed about 32 years ago by John Kabat-Zinn, who was a PhD molecular uh, biologist, who happened to be at the University of Wisconsin, I'm sorry, University of Massachusetts Medical Center.